thank you so much for joining us and I have to say that was quite a warm-up act I thought. I just only want to talk about what those two men talked about. Uh, I thought, I mean David's line about uh, statistics that it is we who imbue them with meaning. I mean that is what we all do with everything all the time and Colin's mother uh, becoming herself when she went home is one of the most moving and troubling um, cultural uh, sentences I, I've heard. I, I thought that both, both talks were absolutely riveting and they actually, they, they sum up everything about my life. <laughs> okay, so what does it sum up? Are you more yourself if you go to Ireland? Well, actually, when Colin started to talk about, about being a, a root with very few, he, very few roots in his, you know, I came from a place with so many roots um, <laughs> that I was thrilled that I had the opposite experience. And I suppose I, I just, I mean, it's, it's not for me to comment on Colin's talk, but to say that he is part of this revolution in history, which is flowering. And uh, I come from an absolute opposite cultural revolution, which was that, a bit like his family, I couldn't wait to come to London when I was uh, a student. I couldn't wait to get to RADA, to the Royal Academy, to study in the British tradition. But I was leaving behind, you know, thousands of years of aunts, great aunts, stories. Yesterday, my brother, Mark, was on the phone. He lives in France. And he started doing the sound of a dog that we used to hear barking across the harbour where we had our summer house. The dog used to go, oh, 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 oh through the sort of foggy summer. And he, he can capture our childhood in a, in a flash. But I was just very interested about about cultures now recovering their past, you know, where I was running away from mine. And I'm not sure at my great age now, am I not regretting some of that? <laughs> That's what I'm getting from these this evening. So when you, when you were last at 5 by 15 and you talked about Yeats and you said a lot of amazing things because I rewatched it the other day. And one of the things you said, you know, why is the world around us never enough? And I mean, you wanted to leave Ireland, Collins, parents wanted to leave Jamaica. I mean, we all go places with the idea that we're going to find something better. Yes, and of course we might for a moment. And um, I mean, I think I, I always felt that with Yeats, that he was always hankering between the heart and the hearth. Mm. And, you know, if you follow your heart, it'll lead you to maybe great suffering and pain, or you could say follow the art or the hearth. Um, um, and I think I was dying to have an experience that was bigger than the experience I felt was waiting for me in Ireland. In fact, when I got to London, I found that most people, I mean, the early 80s, it was much drabber than it became later. And um, there was still a lot of darkness in the West End. You may remember some of that. And it was still it was too expensive to go to the theatre. We were all students, you know, sort of quietly starving. And I realised how rich my life had been in my in my adolescence and my early studentship in Ireland. So yeah, I think you're driven by wanting an experience bigger than your own. And as an actress, multiple experience. That's what you're trying to get is to live many more lives than you could possibly lead in your own life. Well, that's quite an enviable thing to be doing. And I, I was, um, you said when I, we were emailing last week, you know, that you had, you caught the last flight out of Budapest, which is a quite dramatic thing to be able to say that you were there filming Baptiste and then you had to flee. What, what did it mean to you to have to come back and be into lockdown? What, did it, what was it like? Well, I mean, I, I join all of us in that, in that uh, terrified moment. It's just we didn't know that, if we're, that, that I was filming Baptiste, which is a series being made uh, by Two Brothers Films and, and uh, the BBC and, uh, 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 with Cechi Caro. So it's a, a fantastic, uh, a complicated story and we were six weeks into it. Uh, and we were up on the mountains um, in Hungary and uh, shooting away in the freezing cold, a lot of night shoots. But in that last weekend, we were like, um, it was suddenly like sort of a group of rats. There was a lot, there was a lot of, there was a lot of ill ease among the crew. Some people, of course, ignoring the problem that was arising. Some of the Budapest actors saying, you shouldn't be here, it's dangerous. And you think, where is it dangerous? Because nobody could see anything. And by the Monday, 
we were told nothing. By Monday lunchtime, we were told we should go home. And of course, what we didn't know is already by then, Orban had said the borders are closed. So we went home packed and on Tuesday got the last plane out of Budapest. Yeah, it was felt, I suppose, historic in a way, because so many people have taken last planes, last trains, last cars out of places. Yes. Yes. And so how, what have you been doing? Have you found it a creative time? Yes, I I am. Um, I was tempted tonight to, to bore you with them. I, I, I was going to produce my paintings. I paint, when oh. I, but I paint so badly that I thought the only value of those paintings is that nobody must ever see them. So I, I paint, and of course I've had more time to paint, and I read, you know, I, I just read all the books I hadn't read. I read um, uh, The Divine Comedy, you know, Dante, which I'd never read, and it's been, you know, it takes weeks to read, and sometimes you think, I don't know if I can go on with this, but I kept going, and I feel that I've done it. I'm not sure whether I haven't read it a decade or 10 too late, because I think you can read these things early. Uh, so all those heavy books that you can't carry to hotel rooms I've been reading. But a lot of it has been about stopping. Yes, that's what I wanted to ask you about, the difference between being and doing. You're a doer, aren't you? I think I am, or, or what I've just told you about coming to London to, to want to, you know, devote my life to exploring and really uh, experiencing these characters that I played in these largely classical plays but completely modernized so that we could find the essence of the the play but entirely in a modern uh, a modern expression or a modern aesthetic or a modern recognition so the emotional life was always discovered I think it was I must have had a feeling that I had not had enough feelings in my very sheltered upbringing but uh, I feel having stopped that um, just stopped for this reason to not be walloping yourself against a wall as it were emotionally is a very good thing and uh, with this rest has come a kind of stillness and um, I think they may have to drag me screaming you know kicking and screaming back to work because it does feel right and I think for those of us lucky enough um, to be able to stop and not have huge pressures put on that moment because I am fundamentally in a state of work which is great uh, it's been a great privilege yeah and what about the way you think that, I mean, we've all been entertained in very different ways. I mean, we've had to uh, have everything in a sense beamed through our screens or through our televisions. And has that changed? I mean, it does feel like it is quite a golden age for telly right now. Yes, it is. And I had spent, you know, 35 years in the theatre before I really yeah. started a career in television in the last five years. Uh, before that, my, my life was entirely going from one year-long project. Uh, usually the plays I did either began here and then went to New York or went to Paris and then New York or New York and then Paris uh, and these co-productions. And I think, um, but I also think that, that that shift by me, which was came out of weariness actually and just thorough exhaustion after... Testament of Mary, which I did on Broadway about six years ago. I was so tired at the end of that. I thought I've really got to, you know, stop and and see. Can I go on doing these, or are they beginning to lose meaning? These huge, huge projects. And um, at that moment, I think the theatre moved as it happens. I mean, for 10, 15 years before that, it's been moving to this little box in our sitting rooms, which is so that a lot of the writers from theatre have gone into television. A lot of the um, directors who may have gone into the theatre have gone into television. And the, the result is that the performance on television has become much more poetical. I think people from the theatre have moved into television. The television actors are being asked to do a much wider range of things than play a detective or, or mm -hmm. be a baddie or a goodie. Or... So the moral questions that used to be hammered out in the theatre as a public space are being hammered out over these series that take six episodes say or maybe 12 episodes or you know people you know homeland or something that takes many episodes it's a sort of dialogue and it's being able to skim very near the truth of life hasn't it uh, it's been uh, i mean it's a his a golden age of television so what one could also uh, take away from what you just said is that theatre is no longer that place and therefore what does theatre become i mean is it about going out and being entertained by a musical is it still got a challenging future oh yeah i wouldn't dream of saying that because i think that there is fundamentally 
you know, in the same ways we, we may enjoy also not seeing our relatives and friends. Fundamentally, <laughs> we are our relatives and friends, and we we'll have to start seeing them in three D. And you know, we we are we are these fleshy animals. I think we we will have to be in the same presence as other fleshy animals to really understand what it is to be human. So I think the theater will be fine, but it won't be the same theater. And it's partially down to what Colin has just talked about too. You know, the cultural emphasis is not about self-expression anymore, mm -hmm. but about redefining what is the theatre for? It's for different things every decade, you know. For us, it was about, maybe it began with maybe about a feminist discovery of wh where those characters in plays really could be morally more complex than the versions written for, about them before, whether, you know, whether you could play Richard II as a woman, whether that could change the language or the language could stay yep. the same and you fragment it. And I, I think now the theatre is just part of this cultural, historical revolution of discovering what is the history of the countries we are in, countries, because it's, it's not just in Britain. And who, whose stories have we not been hearing? And why haven't we been learning this at school? What is the histories that we haven't been given at school? And I think all schools, you know, are teaching a selected history. In Ireland, we had a, one section of our history was called Irish history, and the rest was called world history. <laughs> so they were equal. So for us, we thought Irish history was probably pretty central to most people's curriculum. <laughs> so every date about the famine, every date about our revolution, we assumed people knew. And of course, I came to England and nobody knew any of it. <laughs> and I think this is now what, what I think the theatre will be embracing, is the cultural expression, imaginative explosion of, of people from other cultures. It's good. And how do you think, sort of last question here, I mean, how, how do you think that, very interesting when you say, you know, the moral complexity can move into television, which it certainly can in things like Killing Eve, um, and indeed Fleabag, which is full of moral complexity. I don't know about Baptiste, but how, how do you think people will... Uh, turn this process, what we're in in the moment, the lockdown, COVID, how do you think that will appear in art? I think, I don't know how it will appear in art because all I know is that I planned to write, you know, four books, 12 plays, three films and 20 <laughs> And I've done none of those things. So I think, I, I think, you know, whatever tilling of the soil, I have to of the soil, I'm growing a few potatoes in the garden. But I, I, I don't know what will happen, but it's certainly, and it may not be uh, people like me or you in your huge experience of writing or me and my huge long experience of performing and analysis of text. It may not be our decision, but yeah. Or, or our influence that's going to really shift the culture. But I have no doubt that it's going to shift. I mean, it's already people's values have begun to shift. People are more happy in their families. People are more happy having sheds at the bottom of their gardens and working from there if they have those sort of jobs. And the value of people's jobs who had been the, the, the motors of our society, like the delivery men and the people working in shops, their value is going to go up and, of course, the, the health workers. So maybe culture or you know, the art of culture uh, will have to take its time and receive a few bits of information before it tells, it te you know, before it starts guiding. It's a good listening time, I think. Very good. And on that note, um, <laughs> thank you so much. And I'm sure everybody has absolutely loved listening to you. And I have, and I will hand back to Daisy. Thank you, Fiona. <laughs>